What happens when God creates a ministry that goes beyond one man's lifetime? In every generation, we need people to find Jesus. Today, we're going to explore two men who've led the vision of Christ for all nations. This is amazing. Come along with me on this great adventure. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. Today, it's easy to rejoice because we're exploring the faith heritage of Christ for all nations. We love when people find Jesus, and CFAN is all about people finding Christ. Christ for all nations introduces Jesus to people, and that by the millions. CFAN is currently led by Daniel Kalinda. Let's go right now to one of his crusades to hear his personal miracle story. favorite miracle stories isn't something that happened in a crusade. It was something that happened to my great-grandfather, Paul. When he was born, he was born with a very terrible genetic disease. They said that when he was born, his head was almost twice the normal size, and it was shaped like an egg that was turned on the side. And the doctors diagnosed him with severe mental retardation. And they told his mother, they said, this boy will not live to be an adult. And they said, that's actually a blessing because if by some miracle he did survive, he would always be a great burden to you. To make a long story short, at two years old, little Paul contracted a lethal case of typhoid fever and died. And that should have been the end of the story, but God. You see, Paul's father, my great, great grandfather, his name was Ludwig, that's a German name. He was a man of faith and prayer. They had come out of the Azusa Street generation and they knew something about the juice that comes from the presence of God. And so when my great-great-grandfather saw his son dead and cold and stiff from rigor mortis lying on that bed, he went and locked himself in his room and said, I'm not coming out of this room until I hear from heaven. And hours later, he emerged from that room. His face was beaming. He laid his hand on the boy's head and life came back into him. Paul sat up in the bed and the very first thing he said was, Mama, I'm hungry. And as you can imagine, everyone was hysterical. This amazing miracle had just happened, but it wasn't until several minutes later they realized that the miracle had not ended with Paul being raised from the dead. They suddenly realized his head had gone to a normal shape and a normal size. This is true, okay? This is not some parable. This is a true story. His head went to a normal shape and size. His mind was clear. There was a strength in his body he had they had never seen before. That little boy that they said would never grow to see adulthood died of old age and never had another serious illness the rest of his life. Not only that, but here's the proof that he was really, really healed. He had 10 sons. And then those 10 boys became preachers of the gospel. And their children became preachers of the gospel. And their children's children became preachers of the gospel. And I'm one of those children. Daniel's grandfather was not ready to quit. He was not ready to lose his son. Yet if he didn't know Jesus could raise someone from the dead, if he didn't know about prayer, we would not have Daniel Kalinda today leading Christ for all nations. In 2018, I interviewed Daniel Kalinda. We found some amazing footage. Let's revisit some of Daniel's revival stories. I can remember missionaries coming through my dad's church and telling stories about the mission field. When I was you know, six or seven years old, if you said to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have said, I want to be a missionary in Africa. Well, I really didn't understand what that meant, of course, sure. and I surely had no idea what, what was going to transpire. But yet you see the seeds of it and you see the fingerprints of God all along the way. So fast forward um, several years, when I was 16 years old, I was part of a revival, this is Pensacola, Florida, uh, an evangelist by the name of Steve Hill was visiting Brownsville Assembly of God, Pastor John Kilpatrick, and, um, and the, the Holy Spirit began to move on that Sunday morning in a really extraordinary way. And the services went on. 
This revival went on for five years. Yeah. And people came from all over the world. Literally a couple million people came from all over the world to the to just to experience what God was doing in this this otherwise small church in the ghetto in a very unimpressive city like Pensacola. Yeah. And I mean, uh, it, it really was extraordinary. You would just to give you an idea, if you lived in Pensacola and you were driving past the church on your way to work at eight o'clock in the morning or even earlier, six o'clock in the morning, you would see a line of people in front of the church that would stretch down the road and around the block. Sometimes thousands of people in the early days of the revival, I would get out of the service at three o'clock in the morning and go get in the line and sleep on the pavement to get into service the next day at 6 p.m. It was not church. It was something else. It was meeting with God. And it, it changed my life. And uh, yeah, I got right with God there. And it literally to this day, I can't be satisfied with just normal churchianity. Remember the Pensacola outpouring? Some called it the Brownsville Revival. If you haven't seen the Revival TV radio programs with Pastor John Kilpatrick sharing inside stories of that five-year revival, make sure you go back and explore those on the website. Now, here's a question. As a 16-year-old, would you have driven eight hours with your friends to attend a church service? This was a life changer for these guys. Would these guys be Apostle Paul or Saul's? Daniel says his whole life was changed with the manifest presence of God. And we have footage of him at the Pensacola outpouring. Let's go to there and hear what happened in his own words. It's, it's really hard to explain. It's hard to put into words. It, was, it felt like the, the manifest presence of God was, was there. Yeah. And we were meeting with God. My name is Dan Kalinda. I'm from Port Charlotte. Um, I was baptized when I was seven or eight years old. And even though I love God with all my heart, I ran after the world because I thought it had something that it could give me. I'm here to tell you tonight that the world has nothing. The world is full of just counterfeit pleasure. But how many know that the kingdom of God is full of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? I'm here tonight because I'm sick of living in mediocrity. I'm sick of living halfway for Jesus. I'm sick of having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And tonight, I'm going to... I'm going to bury that old man that's been tying me down. I'm going to live my life full out for Jesus Christ. But the great thing is that you don't have to be in a revival to experience the yeah. presence of God. You can experience it every day. And that's the beautiful takeaway is that when you have a relationship with Jesus, you can have it in your life. So that's, that's what I, I live with to this day. Daniel gets a word from the Lord that he will work with Reinhard Bonnke. Yet as an 18 year old, he meets Reinhard and nothing seems to break loose. Waiting isn't always fun. When you have a word though, this is the time to actually stand in faith. In this next clip, he talks about that. At that revival, there was a lady visiting by the name of Suzette Hatting. And Suzette, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she was for many years Reinhard Bonnke's head intercessor. Yeah. They, they asked her to come up and to pray just to open the meeting in prayer, just like an opening. And so she began to pray. And Gene, I remember feeling like the air was filled with electricity. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me very clearly. And he said, you're going to work with that man that she had mentioned, which is Reinhard Bonnke. And so, um, I, again, I didn't know who he, wa who he was, but I went back to my room. I wrote a letter and I said, um, the Lord spoke to me today. I'm supposed to work with you. I don't know what that means. I'll carry your bags. I'll polish your shoes. I just know I'm supposed to be there. And so then I went online to try to find the address to send this letter. And that's when I saw for the first time the pictures of the massive crusades wow. in Africa. And I thought, this guy, you know, he'll never get my letter. He probably gets a thousand letters every day. And so I never mailed the letter. I still have it to this day. It's in an old shoebox with a bunch of other old letters. Wow. So that was at 16. At 18, 
I actually met Reinhardt on Pensacola Beach. And it's a long story, but I thought when I met him there, it was such a, a coincidence the way that it all happened. I thought, wow, maybe the Lord really did speak to me. And now I'm going to start traveling with Reinhardt around the world. And he's going to ask me to join his team. And instead he, he said goodbye and he went one way and I went another way. He didn't give me his phone number. He didn't want to stay in touch with me. It was just over. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, man, isn't that crazy? I knew God spoke to me when I was, when I was 16. Now I've met Reinhardt and there was a great connection there, but there seems to be no link. And so years went by. I never heard another word from Reinhardt. And by this time I'd moved on. I was planting churches. I was pastoring. And, um, and so I, I had just started a new church and, you know, church plant pastors, if it's a true church plant, I mean, from scratch, right. it's tough, Yeah. you know, and there's Absolutely. no money and I didn't, I couldn't support my family. So I was looking for a job. Literally, I was willing to work at McDonald's, just anywhere to feed the family. When you're in a season of prep before God releases you to the calling he has for you to do, it's rarely convenient. Dima Shakirian would have understood exactly where Daniel Kalinda was at, trying to cover his family's practical needs. Demas wanted to do ministry and didn't have a clear direction. So he worked areas of preparation as he looked for the calling God had for him. Demas helped Billy Graham and Oral Roberts. In Daniel's prep season, he planted churches. Not just one church, he planted churches. This is boot camp, time to get real with Jesus. Yet how did Daniel get his breakthrough? He needed practical help too, watch. I got a friend that I'd gone to Bible school with. I got a call from him and he said, um, the ministry that I'm working for needs somebody that has a business degree, which I happen to have. He said, Are you, would, you, would you come and in interview for the job? I said, well, what ministry is it? He said, it's Reinhard Bonnke's ministry. Now, last I knew, Reinhard Bonnke was in Frankfurt, Germany, and I was living in Pensacola. And over that period of about six years, I had moved from Pensacola to Tampa. Right. Reinhard had moved from Frankfurt to Sacramento and then to Orlando, and we were now about 40 minutes from each yeah. other. Yeah. It's amazing how God is able to work all these things mm -hmm. that we could never orchestrate on our own. Right. And so, to make a long story short, I ended up going to the office. I got the job. And then a few weeks later, I mean, I was at the very bottom. If you looked at a flow chart of the ministry, I was the last position on the bottom working in the warehouse. Yeah. And um, I was in my office working one day and Reinhardt came in and he saw me sitting there. I don't know if he had any idea, you know, about any of this stuff. But uh, all I know is that my supervisor came in a few minutes later and he said, Reinhardt wants to know if you'd be willing to travel with him as an assistant. And I said, well, let me pray about it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought, well, here it is. Now I'm getting to help a man of God in the ministry. This is what it, this is what the Lord spoke to me all those years ago. And I honestly never thought anything more than that. And you coming. hadn't told anybody about this. I ha I've told my wife, right. my best friend knew about it, but I'd surely never told anybody at CFAN or Reinhardt sure. or anything. In fact, I never told Reinhardt the story I'm telling you until after I was already his successor. Yeah. And he didn't even know during that time that I was a pastor. He didn't know any of this stuff because I never wanted him to feel like I had any ulterior motive. Sure. I was there to serve him. So I did that for several years. I would travel with him. Um, as an assistant, I also would help in the ministry in other ways. I was also pastoring. It was a very, very busy time of life. But then about 10 years ago, Reinhardt said to me, I think you're the man to take this ministry over. Wow. And uh, it, was, it was a process. You know, it didn't happen in one day. But it, it began where he, would sh he gave me about 10%. In the beginning, he would, I just would preach for him 10 minutes before he would preach. He would say to me, I want you to talk for 10 minutes. Don't give an altar call and don't go over your time. So it was almost a test, like seeing if I could just obey orders at first. And so I would do that. Um, I started out, I did it one time, and then he invited me to come do it every time. So I would come to all the crusades and I'd, I'd just kind of talk for 10 minutes before he came. And I'd really just warm the people up to get ready to receive the gospel sure. message. I wasn't trying to be in the spotlight. I wasn't trying to have the best sermon you've ever heard. I just wanted to prepare their hearts to receive you know, what the Lord was going to speak through him. And so that's the way it went for, for probably a year like that. And then he said to me, okay, this time I want you to do the whole message. And there's five major crusade nights in every, right. in every campaign. He said, I want you to preach the whole message, give the altar call, pray for the sick. So I did one and he did the other four. We did that for a while. And then he said, okay, now you're going to do two and I'm going to do three. And then you're going to do three and I'm going to do two. And then you're going to do four and I'll do one. And finally the day came where he said, I'm not coming. You just go and do it. And it was a terrifying day 
uh, I have to admit. But, Where was that? Where did you go that was by um, your cell phone? Yeah, that would have been somewhere in Nigeria. I don't remember the city at the moment, but I remember the feeling of watching him driving away down the dusty road and <laughs> my heart sinking in my chest. And, you know, kind of, I, I probably know a little bit of what it was like when Elijah. Uh, when Elisha watched Elijah, Elijah going away up. in the right. chariot. And it was a little bit of a nostalgic moment, but I said, okay, Lord, now it's me and you. Any calling you do is bigger than the man, bigger than the woman. The move of God is bigger than we can imagine or dream. Daniel Kalinda got a promise from God and God delivered. Thousands of miracles along with millions of people getting born again have now taken place. What was amazing about that crusade is that it started out with about 30,000 people, which is very small for us. Yeah. But then God began doing miracles that were mind blowing, just miracles all over the place. By the end of that week, over 650,000 people were in one meeting. Wow. And so the whole team, I remember sitting in the, our devotions on the last day, it was Sunday morning. And I remember these guys that had been with Reinhardt for 30 years or more, many of them with tears in their eyes, as they said, we never thought it was possible for this to go on in another generation, but wow. today we've seen it's possible. I'm involved in things that are way over my head and uh, it can be quite intimidating and daunting, but I, I have this, this confidence in my heart and I often pray and say, Lord, I didn't ask for this. You assigned this to me, you gave this to me. And so you must know something about me I don't know. Mm. And you must have some grace for me that I don't know about. Yeah. It's about the harvest. And we're living in the time of harvest. Um, you know, I saw a lot of miracles from the platform because we often pray over sure. the crowd as a whole. And so I often would see the miracles after they already happened. And that's awesome. But it's not the same thing as watching it happen right before your eyes. Yeah. And so I was by myself in India. And um, it was a much smaller crowd. And I, I prayed over the crowd. And actually, what was funny about that crusade is I had some terrible kind of stomach thing. Yeah. And, um, and it was so bad that at times I had to sit down while I preached and even while I prayed for the sick. It was very, very painful. But every single person that had a stomach thing out of the crowd was healed. At the end, I remember I, call, I said, if you have not yet received your healing, I want to lay hands on you. And so a group of people came over and there was a girl that they brought to me who was totally deaf in both ears, stone deaf. Right. Not like partial deafness. I mean, she could not hear anything. And she stood before me and she had a little red dot on her forehead, this is sure. India. She was a Hindu and um, her father had brought her there and I prayed for her and I, and I clapped you know, on each side of her ear and she looked at me, she just went like this. So I prayed again, nothing happened. But I closed my eyes and I said, Lord, if you just heal this one, I'll thank you forever. Yeah. And so huh, I laid my hands on her ears and I prayed again, just as I'd done both other times, it was nothing special. And then, um, and then I snapped in her ear and her eyes came open like this and she began to weep and, and she began to scream. And uh, it was the first time I'd seen that happen up close. But what was amazing, and this is even better in my opinion, the next night she came with her whole Hindu family. They all stood up on the platform and confessed Jesus as savior. They right. all became believers because of that one miracle. Right. And it hasn't stopped since. God doesn't need you to be a picture of health to get breakthroughs for others. It's better but he doesn't need you to be. Daniel Kalinda was about bringing others to Christ and seeing them blessed and made whole. We were very inspired hearing Daniel share insider stories on Africa. If you haven't seen our program on the blood covenants where we explored David Livingston and Africa, you need to see those too. Daniel Kalinda's sharing in this next clip was our inspiration for those programs. Daniel starts with David Livingston and the Watchmen. You know, years ago, we discovered in a, in a museum an unpublished journal by the pioneer missionary David Livingston. He was a pioneer who really opened the African continent for other okay. explorers and, evan and evangelist missionaries. And so in this journal, Livingston wrote, he said, we, we don't see very many conversions. There's very little light on our path. No one is interested in our message. I read in another place, Livingston said that on one of his journeys, he'd only led one African to Jesus. And he said, I'm not even sure about that one. It was difficult for him in those days. But wow. then he wrote this in that unpublished journal. This was what Reinhardt was telling me. He said, many years from now, other missionaries will come and they will have more light than we have. And when they preach, sinners will be converted in every meeting. And then he said these words, when that day comes, may they not forget us, the watchmen of the night. Wow. Isn't that powerful? That is powerful. I was standing there on the platform looking into the faces of some of these precious Nigerians, many of whom had just been saved that week or healed. 
And I remembered something that one of the pastors had told me the day before. He said, here in West Africa, we have cemeteries dedicated to missionaries that came in other generations. And he said, you'll notice something peculiar, that in these cemeteries, there are many tombstones that have no names. They only have numbers on them. One will say five, one will say 12, one will say 22, just numbers. He said, those numbers are the number of days that that missionary lived after he arrived on the African continent. Wow. He said in those days it was so common for them to die within days or weeks that if the locals hadn't learned their names yet, they would just simply write the number of days that they had lived. And I stood there on that platform in this ocean of humanity and I had an epiphany. I had a revelation. We were walking down a trail that had been forged by the blood and tears and sacrifice of generations of righteous men and women. Jesus said, generations of righteous men and women have longed to see the things that you see. That's what he told his disciples. Mm -hmm. He said, but blessed are your eyes for they see. And I thought to myself, what would Livingston say if he could stand here on this platform right now and look at the fruit of some of his labor? What about all those missionaries that gave their lives? They never saw the harvest that they prayed for, that they died for. And we are living in this moment of harvest. And then I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me so clearly on that platform. And he said words that I've never forgotten. He said, you dare not fail now in the season of harvest. I realize I have one purpose and that is to point to Jesus. And I realized that in a, in a setting like that, when you have hundreds of thousands, sometimes over a million people in one place at one time, statistically, a percentage of those people are never going to hear the gospel again. Right. And in a crowd that size, the statistics may add up to tens of thousands of people that will never again have a chance to hear the gospel. (laughs) When you feel the weight of responsibility like that in a meeting, it's very hard to get cocky. It's more like, Lord, just help me not to mess this up. Humility is one of the values that all great preachers share. We can talk about Daniel Kalinda, yet we also want to remember this was built on the prayers of Reinhard Bonnke. With Christ for all nations, we've seen all the crowds of Africans that reach as far as the eye can see. They have huge numbers attending their events. If you're only seeing challenges and blocks to your calling instead of the great breakthroughs, let me encourage you. This is exactly where Reinhardt began. 1972, Reinhard Bonnke was a 32-year-old missionary in Lesotho, a small mountainous nation landlocked by South Africa. Reinhardt's ministry had been very difficult up to this point. There wasn't very much fruit. He said that on one occasion he traveled a whole day to reach a village. And when he arrived, only five people attended the meeting and no one got saved. His heart was troubled. He knew there must be more than this. He would cry out, oh Lord, this cannot be it. This cannot be the impact of the glorious gospel. It was a very difficult season in his life in ministry. But then one night he had a dream that changed everything. He saw a gigantic map of the African continent. And as he watched, it became washed in the precious blood of Jesus from south to north and from west to east. And then he heard a mighty voice cry, from Cape Town to Cairo, all Africa shall be saved. And he woke up. Before Christ for All Nations was founded, that comment, all Africa shall be saved, would have been laughable. Now we know better. Where you see challenges, but you have a word, God is faithful to fulfill what he says. Just don't give up, keep going. Daniel Kalinda learned so much watching Reinhardt in action. In the next clip, this desolate place 10 hours from nowhere shows us what could be possible. If you need to be encouraged to believe God for the impossible, you need to watch this. I never like to say that a place is the middle of nowhere because to the people that live there, it's not nowhere, right. it's somewhere. But if there's such a place as the middle of nowhere, <laughs> it's a good run. It's a goja, it. yeah. <laughs> and so I, when we pulled in, I didn't even know it was a city. I thought it was just wilderness. Yeah. And there was a group of elders standing on the side of the road. They welcomed us and they, they began to apologize to, to Pastor Bonke. They said, you know, this will not be one of your great gospel crusades. They said, we are a very small uh, region and there are not very many people will come. But they said, thank you for coming because even other Nigerian evangelists don't want to come here because it's so remote. So anyways, the, the crusade started. The, the beginning, there was about 30,000 people, something like that, which I, it was the first time I'd seen this. 30,000 wasn't too bad. I'd grown up in a church with about 60 people most of my life. So yeah. 30,000 seemed pretty good. But then Evangelist Bonky began to preach. He preached so clear. I'd heard the gospel my whole life. 
I listened to Steve Hill preach, you know, every night for years. Right, right. My father, my grandfather, I knew the gospel. But when I heard Evangelist Bonke, the way he preached it, it was so clear and it was so full of love. And I, I told him at the end, I said, I feel like I heard the gospel for the first time tonight. Yeah. I felt like I wanted to get saved all over again. And then he began to pray for the sick. And I, I knew the stories of miracles. But what amazed me was not how powerful the miracles were. What amazed me was how simple the, the actual prayer was. I, I kind of envisioned Reinhardt doing something like, you know, out of a Disney movie, like Jafar from Aladdin. Yeah. And it was just so simple. It was yeah. just praying in Jesus' name. And these amazing things were happening. and counting. When this clip on the Christ for All Nations ministry was created, sharing how many people found Christ, it was during the transition of leadership from Reinhardt to Daniel. Even in the year that followed, another million people found Christ, and the counting continues. We are assembling the next amazing stories on this ministry that you don't want to miss. What do you want us to join you in prayer over? We're still seeing people pray, and God is still raising the dead. He heals. He can do the impossible. We have an awakening in progress. You need to be a part of it. Until then, we'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV.